All right. Thank you all for joining us. Jordan, would you like to do roll call? Or do you want to stand for the pledge first? We can do roll call. Okay, let's do roll call and then we'll stand. Chair Lorene? Here. Vice Chair Bromfield? Board Member Rich? Here. Board Member Strom? Here. Board Member Massing? Board Member Mathers? Here. Board Member Vitali? Here. All right, now everyone, let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Move approval. I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Fantastic. Do we have any comments from the public on non-agenda items? Okay. Any virtual comments? No. Great. Comments from board members on non-agenda? Okay, great. Um, the first item, which I am to read, correct? The full item? Okay is CPUD amendment to incorporate automotive repair as an allowed use quasi-judicial ordinance 2475-2021, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Stewart, Florida, amending the Century Plaza commercial planned unit develop <clears throat> development located on the west side of US Highway 1 North of its intersection with Central Parkway to allow automobile repair services major on parcel two through five of the CPUD, providing for certain developmental documents and conditions, providing for severability, providing for an effective date and for other purposes. Okay, um, do the commissioners have any ex parte communications to disclose? Okay, great. Um, City attorney, do you need to place any witnesses under oath? Will all of those giving testimony tonight please stand and raise your right arm, including the intervener and anybody on behalf of the applicant that are going to be testifying right now? Okay, so you're not testifying right now, okay? So let the record reflect we have one, two, three, four people providing testimony. Mike, um, oh. that gentleman. Okay, thank you. Will the development department please provide a brief summary of the agenda item, including the location, size of the property, current zoning, zoning requested, and list the applicant's request to deviate from the land use development regulations. You should include a summary of the position of the intervener, and the intervener will have the opportunity to clarify during the presentation. Hello, Madam Chair. Erin Wilitka with the development department. The request before you is to amend the Century Plaza commercial planned unit development by providing an amendment to the PUD agreement to allow automobile repair services major on parcels two through five of the CPUD. The Century Plaza CPUD was um, approved in 1990. There have been many subsequent amend amendments to the CPUD, both uh, for a revision of the PUD agreement and for the timetable of development. Um, the current permitted uses list for parcels one, two, three, four, and five does not currently include automobile repair services. And on parcel six, um, the only permitted use is for the suburban lodge facility, which is a hotel motel. The project zoning for the CPUD is, the zoning is a commercial planned unit development, future land use is commercial. The previous use was the Goodwill Stewart Store and Donation Center, and the existing use is vacant commercial. Goodwill left um, the property and relocated sometime last year. And the two maps that you see in front of you are the zoning and future land use map. The zoning map you can see above is industrial land and the pink um, it are, is a commercial planned unit development and the yellow is R3. The yellow that you see in the bottom left hand corner of the zoning map is the town park condominiums. And for future land use, um, you see a mix of industrial, commercial, and institutional future land uses. 
In terms of project information, like I had stated before, there's a mix of industrial, commercial, and multifamily residential uses. This is the site survey. Um, the previous Goodwill, which is the building and property subject to this amendment, um, is located on four parcels. Um, the suburban lodge is to the south. Uh, the vacant bank building, which is currently being retrofitted to be a cure leaf medical marijuana dispensary, is to the southeast. And directly to the west is the preserve tract for the PUD. This is um, the project site information that was submitted for their proposal. Um, the applicant is proposing to utilize the existing building. Um, they're planning to gate off the western parking area um, from the portica share westward to the preserve area north and then connects at the northeast corner of the building. They're proposing on relocating um, a couple of shrubs where new uh, roll-up garage doors will be located and that I'll show you on the elevations. The applicant has demonstrated that they meet the parking requirements um, by providing 59 spaces where 55 are required. In terms of architectural modifications, the applicant is proposing the addition of roll-up garage doors, the addition of spandrel windows, a six-foot tall galvanized chain link fence with black PVC privacy slats, which is what I had mentioned uh, previously, um, with a double entry exit gate and rolling sliding entry exit gate, the relocation of bushes, and new paint colors. Staff has analyzed this application. Um, the first issue that we would like to bring to your attention is that the application was um, submitted by the contract purchaser of, of the subject property, specifically Sam Baird, the CEO, signed on behalf of Collision Craft. The city's code requires that a completed application shall be signed by all owners or their agent of the property subject to the proposal and notarized. Signatures by other parties will be accepted only with notarized proof of authorization by the owners. In a case of corporate ownership, the authorized signature shall be accompanied by a notation of the signer's office in the corporation and embossed with a corporate seal. In addition to the applicant being signed by the contract purchaser of the property, um, the other property owners within the CPUD did not sign the application. However, the president of the Century Plaza POA submitted a letter to the city that states that the board voted unanimously in favor of the association granting its consent to the application based on a supermajority of the shareholders, members of the association. The vote further granted and authorized the president of the association to sign and provide the letter to the city as well as execute any other necessary documents in order to amend the PUD to allow auto repair services as an additional permitted use on parcels two through five inclusive. Additionally, as a part of staff's analysis, we looked at the autom automobile repair services major and minor use. Um, in section 2.02.02, .02, table two of the land uses, um, automobile repair services are allowed through the city commission public hearing process in a CPUD, which is the zoning designation for this property. Staff has included um, within the agenda, within the ordinance, and right here um, on the presentation, some draft conditions of approval. Um, the first is a code section that the use shall be conducted within a fully enclosed building. Um, another is that vehicles are not permitted to be parked within the fenced area after business hours. Outdoor storage is prohibited on the property. The roll-up doors shall remain closed at all times except when vehicles must enter and leave the service phase. Vehicles are prohibited to be serviced, cleaned, or stored underneath the portica share. A unity of title would be required prior to first CO. And then some other code sections in regards to sound, in regards to permits, um, in regards to stormwater, uh, limitations in regards to construction activity, and that any existing infrastructure, sidewalk, or private property that's damaged during construction shall be repaired or replaced prior to the issuance of a CO. Furthermore, according to section 11.01.10a of the Land Development Code, any minor amendment or, uh, to a previously adopted PUD zoning ordinance, including both conditions and PUD agreements, shall be processed as, as if the proposed amendment is a new rezoning application. So in front of you are the criteria for rezoning that the local planning agency shall consider if applicable. The existing land use pattern, 
the possible creation of an isolated district, the population density pattern, the possible overloading of the city's sewage collectin collection, treatment, and disposal facilities, the possible overloading of the city's drainage system, the existing district boundaries for the subject property, the existence of changed or changing conditions which make the passage of the proposed use necessary or appropriate, the impact of the proposed use upon living conditions in the adjacent neighborhood, the impact of the use upon the flow of light and air to adjacent areas, the impact of the proposed use upon property values, the impact of the proposed use upon improvement or development of adjacent property in accordance with existing regulations and the existence of other adequate sites in the city for the proposed use in districts already permitting such use. We do have an intervener which has raised a total of three issues with this letter that was submitted to the city on November 5th. The first issue was that the application should be processed as a major PUD amendment. The application was originally submitted as a minor PUD amendment. This has since been rectified. Um, the additional fee has been submitted to the city as well as the revised application and is being processed as a major PUD amendment. The second issue is permitting auto repair services major will disturb the customers at the Suburban Lodge Extended Stay Hotel and is disruptive, inconsistent with, and inappropriate in close proximity to the longstanding prior uses within the PUD. And three, the application fails to comply with section 11.01 of the LDC as it has not been signed by all owners or their agent of the property subject to the proposal. The letter states that the applicant did not include the signature of Stuart Hills and instead included a letter from the uh, POA. The applicant has given public notice and uh, staff's recommendation is that the local planning agency review the evidence and criteria for the CPUD amendment, which was the rezoning criteria I previously stated, testimony from the applicant and intervener, and receipt of public comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I'll yield to the petitioner. Uh, Tyson Waters on behalf of the petitioner um, with the law firm of Fox McCluskey here in Stewart. Um, I, I want to thank staff. We've been working with them actually since April on this project, and they did a very good job, and we appreciate their effort. And I thought they did a great presentation giving you an overview of what we're proposing to do. Um, just a couple of, of documents that I have. First, I think it's important. So I think we're down to really two issues that we're dealing with. One is compatibility with the surrounding area. And then to this issue of authority, which I think at the end of the day becomes kind of a, a, a larger issue that we'll spend more time on discussing. Um, because I think the compatibility issue, I don't really think there is one once you look at all the facts and where this project is located. Uh, the project's located right on Federal Highway. So your major thoroughfare in the city of Stewart. Um, it has frontage on, on Federal Highway. Um, as you can see, intense development all around it. You can go to the, the next slide. So this is the future land use map, kind of blown out so you can see a little bit more than what the, the city showed you in their, their presentation. The red, you can see our pro property outlined in black. The red is commercial. The gray is industrial. So this property abuts industrial lands. And the north, immediately north of them, they already have a car, I believe a car repair shop, a marine warehouse, and other um, industrial type uses across the street, as you probably know from looking at the aerial, are, are really intense industrial uses. And then throughout, up and down uh, Federal Highway are commercial uses. The, the blue in the back is a multifamily residential development. But what's important, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk up here, I'm trying to talk a little out loud so I can be a brighter. <laughs> well, I think you can see the, the, between the, the black line, the, the western edge of my black line, there is what appears to be another parcel before you get to the blue. That's actually, that's actually a 100-foot landscape buffer. And if you're ever back in that area, it's a pretty dense landscape buffer. So even though we abut multifamily residential dwellings, um, there's a large buffer between the two. And where the existing buildings locate, it's located between the existing Goodwill Center, which is going to be the, the new um, repair center, and the front of the multifamily. It's approximately 230 feet. So there's a lot of space between the two uses. And if you want to go to the next one. And so this is the zoning map. Again, blown out a little bit more to see than what the city showed you. But what it shows you is the zoning for the surrounding properties. 
again, immediately north of this property are industrial uses, industrial zone properties. Um, you see a, the, the kind of the light pink is uh, CPUDs, which auto repairs are an allowable use kind of through this public hearing process. And then everything else in red is B2. And auto repair sales or auto repairs is an allowable use in those zoning districts. So again, we're in the heart of this pretty intense area right on Federal Highway, most of which allows what we're asking for. So it's very compatible with our surrounding areas. Um, the, the request today is to modify the use on parcels two through five. Those parcels are what's subject to this application. We have no recommendation or request to change parcel one and no request or recommendation to change parcel six. The only parcel that's subject to this application are parcels two through five, which is, as staff presented, is gonna be under a unity of title. And that, that's, that's important for part two of this conversation. Um, again, I've, I've, I've talked about, kind of through those pictures, a lot of the, the compatibleness of the area. US-1, adjacent to industrial, adjacent and part of commercial development on a high intense, high traffic area, right where you want this type of use. And I think what's important is, I think in and of itself, this use is compatible with the surrounding areas. But as additional protection and additional guidance, we've agreed, and as part of this PUD, there's a number of conditions that staff went over that further restrict and protect, protect not just our neighbors within the development, but all of the surrounding areas. Um, all of the operations are gonna be fully, thank you. All of the, thank you. <laughs> Uh, all of the operations are going to be fully indoors. So the repair work, it's not going to be outside in the parking lot. It's going to be inside um, within the building. The vehicles are not permitted to be parked within the fenced areas after business hours. So this is a typical business. So your hours are, you know, 7.38 to 5.30, 6 o'clock. When it closes down, those vehicles are not, al not allowed to be parked in the, the parking areas. Um, outdoor storage is prohibited. Um, the rolled up doors to remain closed with the exception of vehicles entering and leaving bays. So everything's going to be operated on and repaired inside in a closed facility. So the only time you're going to be able to see inside the building is when vehicles are coming into the shop and out of the shop. All of the work is otherwise going to be in a closed facility. So passerbys, whether it's Federal Highway or along this road to access Stuart Lodge or the other um, facility that's coming in there, they won't know what's going on inside the property. Um, no vehicles may be serviced or cleared in the drive through area. So this Goodwill kind of in the back had an area where you could drive through and drop off clothes. That's not considered indoors. So no work can be prepared. No work can be done within that area either. Um, and then all noise must comply with codes. So even though we're inside in a closed facility, we still have to comply with all of your noise ordinances. Um, and again, we're only going to be operating during normal business hours. So hotel guests, they're not gonna be disturbed when they're in their unit at night or in the morning. Um, so I think with, with all of these, with, with the existing environment and all of these development conditions that we've agreed to as part of this PUD, I think we're certainly demonstrated that we're compatible with the area. It's appropriate use within, um, within this parcel right on US-1. I think we've satisfied all of those conditions that the staff has told you to look at. Um, and now we go to perhaps the more important issue and, and the bigger issue in this room. And I, I honestly think it, it applies not just to this project, but kind of moving forward on other projects too. Um, this issue, as staff points out, that an application is required to be signed by all owners or their agent of the property subject to the proposal. So that's the important word, subject to the proposal. The only parcels that are subject to this proposal, the only parcels that are gonna be changed based on this proposal are parcels two, three, four, and five, which are owned by the applicant. Parcels one, parcel six are not subject to this, this property. I, I don't dispute that they might be affected by it, but that's why we give notice. That's why you have the opportunity to be heard. That's why you have the opportunity to be intervened so you can participate in. But to say this project cannot move forward because of another property that's within the same development but not subject to this proposal, not directly affected and gonna be changed by this proposal, has to sign off. I think it's, it's, it's incredible and really will have a chilling effect on other developments within the city that have mar multiple parcels within it. 
approximately two years ago, I was in front of this board as well as the city commission to amend uh, the development approvals within the Harborage. It was my client who owned one lot, one out parcel, and the association that we were the applicant and we moved forward. Had we been required to obtain the 130 unit owners within the Harborage, it never would have happened. Even there's no way that I could, one, get 130 people to agree with me, let alone track 130 people down to get them to sign an application. That can't be the intent of this. The intent is if you're going to change someone's land, they have to participate, they have to sign off. That's what it has to be, and that's what we believe it is. Everyone that was affected, everyone affected in the harborage certainly was able to attend because they were given notice. They were given the opportunity to be heard and speak, but they weren't required to be an applicant because their parcels, their units, were not the subject of what we were trying to change. Um, and, and take it even a step, I guess even a closer step to this. Had my clients decided, you know what, we're going to just change this to a bank. So we don't need to modify the permitted uses, but we'd like to make the property a little bit prettier. So we're going we're gonna to spruce up the building a little bit, and we're going to add more landscaping. Sounds like a great idea. I don't know who would be opposed to that. But th for me to do that, I have to amend my PUD. I have to amend the PUD to get landscape plan approval as well as a site plan approval. Well, guess what? Under this interpretation, I can't do that unless the other property owners within this subdivision, within this development, sign off and agree to do it. So now I'm held captive even for the smallest thing if I want to amend these approvals because I might have one property owner that says, you know what, no. Or I might have a property owner that's in Europe and I can't touch base with them and I can't get them to sign and I can't move forward to make the smallest modifications. That's the chilling effect we're going to deal with. It has to be, and I think the appropriate interpretation is, if you're asking to change someone's property, change the uses, change the site plan, change whatever on that property, that's when they have to be a party to the application. And that's what we have here. We're only asking you to change parcels two, three, four, and five. You've got the applicant in front of you. You've got the applicant that signed the application. You've got a neighbor that was provided notice, and they're here to participate. But to say that we're not going to be able to move forward on any future development or issues with this site because we've got a, a neighbor that refuses to sign and participate in anything, I, I think that cannot be the way that we move forward. Um, again, I think the public purpose is met by allowing people to participate. The public purpose and the betterment of this city is not met by requiring every single owner in a development to sign off on an application when their property is not subject to that change. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and um, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Do any of the members have questions for the applicant? No one? Okay. Does the intervener have questions for the applicant? No questions. Um, okay, so intervener, you may now present. Thank you. So I do. It's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Scott Kanopka. I'm an attorney with Mirachik Law. I am here to represent the intervener who is uh, joined by uh, their manager today, Louis Foodie. And uh, so the intervener is a neighbor. Uh, and is one of the owners of the properties that are subject to the plan unit development, the CPUD. And so uh, we do object to this proposal because it violates the, the code of the city. It has not been signed by the owners that are subject to the change in the PUD. There can only be one real meaning of, of property subject to the change. That is the owners of the CPUD that is being changed by your proposed change in the ordinance or your recommendation. It, so it's, it's anomalous to say that this, this potential uh, requested application only, only affects and only changes and only makes subject to the change these properties that are represented by the owners here today. It changes a CPUD that has been in place for decades. That CPUD has a master plan that all of the property owners agree to. That master plan has specific uses that are permitted, that all of the owners relied upon and agreed upon and made their investments when they purchased their property. My client purchased a significant asset, has spent a lot of money upkeeping it and upgrading it, and it is a very nice extended stay hotel, 
And that was all done in reliance upon the CPUD. And that reliance was specifically based upon the very specific uses that were permitted in that document. And I've provided that document to Mr. Mortel, but um, I'll just refer specifically to the uses that are permitted on parcels two through five. Retail and retail service establishments, business and professional offices, real estate and insurance agencies, financial institutions, banks, restaurants with liquor service, drive-in restaurants, barber beauty shops, hotel motel, multifamily or residential units, combined with non-residential uses, art galleries, travel agencies, laundry cleaning facilities, or other similar storefront uses, schools, child care centers, nursery, preschool, kindergartens, child care, medical facilities and clinics, lodges and fraternal organizations, bakeries, veterinarian animal clinics, recreational facilities such as bowling, skating, miniature golf, health spa club, printing shops, research facilities, ACLFs, congregate living facilities or nursing home facilities. Conspicuously absent is a collision depot or auto repair center, which is in many jurisdictions considered an industrial use. And while um, there is industrial uses to the north, they are not contained within this PUD. And the owners within this PUD would never have approved of an industrial-like use when they bought into this PUD and they bought their properties. So if the PUD is going to be changed, the properties subject to that change are the ones that have to approve of the uses here. Simply put, that's what your code requires. That's what Mr. Mortel earlier opined on in, in correspondence. I believe that was his position initially to the applicant, and that has not been satisfied. And there's good reason to require all of the owners to agree when there's a CPUD with six lots. They have vested property rights. The CPUD controls all of their activities, their development, and requires their consent to change any of it. So your city code is simply confirming the vested property rights that these folks have already agreed upon within, within their own documents to require. And simply put, that hasn't been done here. So in terms of the very, uh, the very specific and overarching issue of, of authority, um, 11.0110 specifically requires all the owners to join in, and that wasn't done. Now, let me just briefly mention what the applicant tried to do to circumvent that requirement, because it knew that all of the owners subject to this application had to join, and it asked my client to join, and my client declined, even though offers of money were made. My client said, I cannot abide by an industrial type use. It's too noisy, even if you do it indoors. The, the light and the, and the other type of noise pollution are not compatible with an extended stay hotel. And why is that? It's because these folks who stay at the hotel, it's like their home. They stay there for weeks at a time, sometimes months at a time. Would any of us want a collision depot to be put into our backyard without our consent, without our approval? I think the answer to that is no, that's a very easy answer. And that's why my client refused to sign off on the application. So then what did the applicant do? The applicant initially did not just submit this application and say, the lodge, the hotel is not a property subject to the change. What they did was a clever bait and switch. And they said to the hotel, we no longer need your consent because we're going to, without notice, kick you out of our property owners association and then get the POA to provide approval. And why was that done? The only reason why that was done is because the applicant knows that in lieu of every owner signing off as required by section 11.01, .01, they, they thought they could create a proxy for owners signing off by having the POA sign off. That might have worked if the POA documents permitted the association to stand in place of the owner. That's not what the POA documents provide for, and we've given those to the city council. The Property Owners Association governing documents does not state anywhere 
that the association has the authority to change any of the zoning, to affect the CPUD, to sign off on applications for owners. Doesn't say any of those things. So the applicant's attempt to use that association as a proxy for the individual owner has no legal authority whatsoever, but more importantly, I think it's a real indication of their knowledge that the owners are required to sign off. They know that this, this ordinance requires all the owners to approve of it because they're all being subjected to the change. And the only reason why they booted the hotel out of the POA improperly and without due process and then had the POA sign an approval was to, was to attempt to meet that requirement under section 11.01 .01 of the city code. But that, that cannot possibly uh, succeed because again, the property owners association governing documents very clearly do not give the association any power to sign off on an application. Therefore, it's what we call ultra vires, has no effect whatsoever. So the motive was clear. Their knowledge of the subject to language clearly shows that they, they knew the owners had to agree and they circumvented that in their effort to change, um, change that requirement into something that a, a simple POA could sign off on. So um, we, we do object to the submission of the application without our client's signature. Um, we, uh, by the way, so this is the first I'm hearing today that a, a new application was submitted to change the minor application to a, a major change application. I did not know that. Um, I just got notice of this meeting about 45 minutes before it started. So um, I think the city clerk was out with COVID, I understand, so I'm not blaming anybody. Um, that's, that's unfortunate, I hope she's okay. But I just have to put my objection to notice on the record because uh, of that issue. My clients, who are the owners of the hotel, can't be here today because they're not in the, in the county. So they've sent Lewis in their place, but Lewis isn't prepared to testify. So um, we, we ask that for notice purposes as well that this meeting be um, readjourn to a point after we get proper notice as an intervener, not just public notice. I'm not denying the public notice was provided, by the way. I concede that. So third and lastly, I'd like to address the compatibility issue. Uh, I mentioned that the industrial uses are not a part of the CPUD. They're also not within the CPUD. And the uses that are adjacent are not a collision depot and they are not as intense as a collision depot. And I don't think you'll find a collision depot in the vicinity. The vicinity is retail. That's what's in this parcel right now. These six properties are all a retail-like use. And the new use going in where the BB&T bank is is going to be a retail use, the, um, the medical marijuana center. So uh, given that uh, the extended, the suburban extended stay hotel is like a home. And these people go to this hotel and they stay there for extended periods. And given that my client relies upon that business model and has invested significantly in the city of Stewart by buying that property and maintaining it and keeping it um, in the standards to which uh, you see it. It's, it's a nice upkept hotel for an extended stay it would be highly incompatible to foist upon this owner a use that it never approved of, it will not sign off on, and it needs to sign off on in order for this to, to be approved by the city of Stewart. So um, I, I think that's everything. I wanna just check my notes briefly. A quick analogy. You know, if, if you had a property in, let's say, any, any property owners association, the Monarch, the Meadows, Martin Downs, and your neighbor was changing his use to something that's not permitted by the association documents, don't, don't even necessarily call it a collision depot, but maybe making it multifamily, would you give up your rights to object to that because the association approved of it? because the Monarch POA decided to sign off on it, because they're getting paid money to allow a multifamily uh, change in use? The answer is no, you wouldn't do that normally. And the analogy that, that has been made here by Mr. Waters is that 
the POA has that authority simply because it would be uh, too risky and too interfering to allow an individual owner to, uh, to interfere with this kind of application. Well, the applicants signed up for that when they bought the property. They signed up for it knowing it was within a CPUD and knowing that all of the owners would have to change it if they wanted to change it. So what they're trying to do now is an end run around that requirement because they can make more money putting in an incompatible use. You are the separation between my client's property rights and their desire to make money and, and add to their bottom line and profit. So I, I, I appreciate your time. I ask you to look carefully at the authority issue, the compatibility issue, and ask yourselves if you would agree to this kind of change if it was in your backyard. Any questions I can answer? Do, is this the point that we can ask them questions, him sure. questions? Okay. Whatever it says on the green sheet. Uh, that's what I was trying to follow. <laughs> uh, they're very, okay, yes. Do, does, do you, anyone on the um, committee wish to ask questions? I do. I was gonna say I do, but I'll let you guys go first. <laughs> so Mr. Walitka? Kanapka. Kanapka, okay. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, that was actually my question was going to be to you, sir. He, agreed, he also gonna indicated some, he provided documents. I'm going to take documents. a minute to read Scott's notes first. If <laughs> <laughs> probably a lot better than what I just said. <laughs> so, for what it's worth, let, let me be clear that Aaron, on behalf of the city, when doing the review, received an application for a permit and said that she couldn't, or not permit, for a to move forward, but she said she couldn't process it without everybody's signature. Um, as Mr. Kanopka points out, the, the question about properties, the, the examples were Monarch or something, in, um, or whether it's Windermere or, or the Pines or wherever it might be, Harborage being another condo that uh, Mr. Waters referred to, if Harborage came in today and wanted to do um, they own the property that's the grass field across the street there, too. Originally, there was a phase two in that. And let's say that Harbridge wanted to come in and build a landscape parking lot in that grass field that's in that plaza that's across the street on uh, Dixie or whatever you want to call that road, used to be a one The city code says that the Harbridge Development Order, or PUD, the code requires the signatures of all owners to move forward to amend the PUD. So historically, does that mean that every single condo owner in the Harbridge, as well as anybody that owns any boat slips, as well as the restaurant owner, as well as the marina owner, all have to sign their signatures to the um, application? And the answer to that question is, is yes, I guess. I mean, that, the code says what the code says. When that happened, and, and Aaron pointed that out, Aaron, um, triggered a meeting with the applicants and Mr. Waters came in and we met with them and and during that meeting Mr. Waters did in fact point out that on multiple occasions in the past the city has allowed for um, the assignment of that signature authority. For example we recently had a project called the Canner LLC and it was a Costco and some apartments out on Canner Highway and a company by the name of m, &M Construction was the applicant. But during the process of that quasi-judicial hearing, you probably learned that the property was owned by a gentleman by the name of Mahmoud Hadid, as well as another section was owned by Dr. Nimi or Nimi Holdings or something to that effect. And they had signed documents assigning to m, &M Construction the ability to come in and sign on their behalf and pursue the stuff. In many occasions, the city has situations where Vista Pines or where the Pines or where um, maybe a Will Willoughby's not in the city, but where you have these developments that the HOA or the POA does in fact have the authority in their governing documents to designate the president of the POA, HOA, whatever it is, to have the legal authority to sign the applicant application and move forward on behalf of 
whatever the entity is. Another subject would be if three people, you know, owned a corporation, the city doesn't know what the personal bylaws of the corporation say or what the LLC regulates as it pertains to who has signature authority of the shareholders. But if the owner of one of the owners of a corporation, the president of the corporation comes in and says, hey, I, I own ABC Corporation and we own this land and we want to do this. And he signs the affidavit and says, I'm the owner. Obviously, the city's responsibility is to believe him or at least rely on it and process the application. In this particular instance, following the rejection of the initial application because it didn't have all the signatures, on October 14th, the city was provided with a letter that said, to whom it may concern, please find this letter as the Century Plaza Property Owners Association's letter of support and joinder for the proposed Century Plaza planned unit development, amended proposed m and development, goes on and on and on and on. And it, at the last paragraph it says, at a special meeting of the board of directors of the association, duly noted, noticed and with a quorum in attendance, the board voted unanimously in favor of the association granting its consent to the application to amend the PUD based in part on the supermajority of shareholders, et cetera, and it supported it. We then, um, it said, for the vote further granted and authorized the president of the association to sign and provide this letter to the city as well as execute any other necessary documents in order to amend the PUD to allow auto repair services as an additional permitted use in parcels two through five. The staff, nor myself, nor anybody at the city has any legal standing to rule in favor of Mr. Knopka or to rule in favor of Mr. Waters as to what their POA authorizes or doesn't authorize. I, even if, by the way, I've never seen it when we saw this letter and it doesn't matter to me because I'm not a judge it's to, I don't, even whatever I thought wouldn't matter because it's an internal contractual relationship between the members of that essentially that limited partnership that is created by this document if in fact the HOA document or in this case it's POA because it's a property associations document authorizes the board to vote and make decisions that allow the president of the board to make applications to amend the PUD, then in fact the property owner has complied with the code and the code does have the signatures of all the property owners because it's been assigned by their adoption of the POA and being participant of the POA when they bought into the condo association or bought into the PUD the first day they bought it. And when you sign it, they say, did you read the HOA docs? You sign them and they are amended from time to time as it goes or whatever they are. The, the alternative to that would be that in every single circumstance that anything ever had to happen, if one person residing in Martin Downs objected to the clubhouse getting new windows on a permit, I'm using Martin Downs, it's not in the city of Stewart, You'd say, well, no, you have to have all the owner's signatures. And they simply would not be able to acquire all the owner's signatures. So for efficiency purposes, lots of HOAs do, in fact, dedicate that. It turned out that in the Hardridge case that Mr. Waters was referring to, it was undisputed. The, that nobody even objected that they didn't have the authority to do it even to this day. That issue has never come up. They had the authority to sign it. They signed it. That's how it happened. In this particular case, we have, a, we have a different situation. The situation we have today is that you have, and I don't know how many members there are in the POA because it doesn't, I'm not a member. There's parcels within it, but I know that there's one of the members here saying, we're not, we're objecting and we didn't sign it. And by the way, it's our opinion that your POA, that the POA doesn't allow the president of the POA to sign on our behalf. And he also says he was kicked out illegally. Well, I, I heard that today, too, and I don't know if that's the case, and that's not in the letter. We and if he was if kicked out, them, right, don't I don't know. know that that also matters <laughs> to the city, whether he was kicked out or not. I hope he wasn't kicked out. But, but I mean, but it doesn't matter to the city if he was kicked out or okay. wasn't kicked out. The only issue we need to know is whether or not they can mm -hmm. sign uh, 
by a majority vote, I guess is the way to describe it. I don't think you could t kick them out of the, the thing. I don't know if that would affect the way they would get quorum or not. But, but for what it's worth, there's never going to be a day that the city LPA or city commission would resolve that question. Because if, in fact, there's an internal dispute with regard to the rights and obligations under their internal POA document, the circuit court would be the place to resolve that. So what, what, what staff did is came to me and said, well, can we go forward on this? And, and I said, well, I'm not at liberty to tell the applicant that I'm siding with the resident or the owner of the hotel and that your POA documents do or don't say that, and therefore you can't even come forward. And I told the applicant that I'm also not at liberty to side with them to tell the hotel that in fact, no, you're wrong. The applicant does have the right to vote for a majority and go forward. But, but I did feel that at a minimum, we have an obligation for due process and had an obligation to let them present their case to the government board as it related to it because they provided us with a corporate resolution and, and said, look, we have this authority. And so the, whether they have the authority or not is a challenge internally that they should address one way or the other. What does concern me for today's purposes was Scott's comment that he didn't actually have notice of the meeting mm -hmm. because it is a quasi-judicial hearing and, and I want to make sure people have notice of the meeting and he is accurate to say that the the clerk has been out for two weeks with COVID and so, so and she will be okay but I, I think we should address that. It, I don't know if it was actually a motion for continuance or not but it matters and I think you should address it. As it relates to the issue of authority to move forward, I would, this signature thing, the only issue I think that the board should to decide is as a board, if there was nobody objecting, does the board believe that the code allows an HOA or a property association to assign that authority to the president of the association? Or does the board believe that no, our policy is all signatures or the matter can't come forward? Not picking one of these guys as right or wrong because I don't want to go down that path because I don't think there's any evidence before us for you guys to even try to, number one. But number two, I don't think you have the jurisdiction or the authority to do it anyway. But just simply, if your position on this board is that no, I don't care if they had a 100% vote of all their board members that said one guy can vote or one guy can sign it, we want all signatures on all matters and that's what the code says and I think that Aaron attached it to your agenda item. It's like on page two of her explanation. If in fact that's your position, then, then you probably should vote that way and that's a direction to staff and that'll be a direction to the city commission and the city commission would have to resolve it too to say that moving forward, the staff is not to accept assignments like that and that they need the signature of all owners in that property. Not, let's not, in this particular question issue, the question, their question is, did the property association allow them to do it? Did their internal corporate documents allow them to have that meeting and make that vote? We don't know, and we're not parties to that document. But let's assume, let's say if I said it did, it did, it did. Let's if, if I said, okay, that document allowed them to do it. Well, okay, but does it make it okay now? Would this board still allow one signature to move forward on this PUD amendment, or would you still require all seven parcels or property owner's signature to move forward. So if you're going to answer that question, I think it should be limited to that because I think that they should, they could file a circuit court judge and seek an injunction to stop us from moving forward. My concern from the city's perspective is that I can't tell you to not move forward. 
because if it got into circuit court litigation and it lasted for four years, and at the end of four years, the circuit court judge ruled in favor of the applicant and said, yeah, you should have moved forward, City of Stewart. But in the meantime, lots of damages accrued. It, it, it could be a problem that, that the city would have because there's a new statute that just came out last year about property rights, and we had to amend our comp plans because of it, and it defined the speed to which the staff has to process things. So we can't just stand back and say, we'll wait to see what you guys resolve. We don't have the ability to do that. On the other hand, I also don't think it's appropriate for you to just vote Scott looks handsome today, and therefore we're voting in his favor too, because that's not based on the evidence, and the evidence would be what's ever internally there. The question for the city's policy is, the code reads and says what it says. Historically, there has been assignments or delegation of signatures like that, is that deemed appropriate or not? And then also I think you should address the continuance issue. And then finally, obviously, there's also the underlying application itself, uh, assuming that it was a bank or whatever it is, what's the landscaping, what's the setbacks, the, you know, lighting, fencing, noise, da 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 da, da that, that normally takes place. And I, you know, obviously, that's for the board as well. But I just wanted to clarify the, 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 the issue for the city side of it. We did not take a position, and I, I still don't know who's, who's right. And I'm not guessing, and it doesn't matter. I, you know, I don't have the authority to decide. I just wanted to let you guys know that. And if you have any other questions before I sit down. Well, okay, first of all, you said you were going to clarify it for us. <laughs> I'm going to clarify that you're not ruling on what their you are, you seem to be asking us to do two different things, Mike. You're saying, you're saying I'm not going to touch this POA issue, and whether authority exists within this group. However, how many members are in the POA? Three. There's six six parcels. So six parcels okay. within the POA. And there's three people on the POA who vote. Well, there's there's six parcels within the POA. Okay, but that's. But somebody may own more than one parcel, apparently. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the answer to the question is three. So currently there's, there's, there's three. And there were four. No, no. Oh, he, so he was not kicked out. They're in the association. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's three. Do they, have a, do they have a vote? They have one vote. They own parcel six and they have okay. a vote. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Oh. But my, so, uh, and that, yet you're saying we have to decide whether every POA in the city of Stewart, and you don't get to say this very often, but it's, I mean, your question was reductio ad absurdum. No, it wasn't. You, no, yeah, I you're saying, well, we have to get a hundred. Yeah. Okay, in the organizations I've been involved with, some authorities are granted to say the executive committee right. and just the president can sign, but then others are, oh, well, if you want to tear down half the buildings, yeah, you have to get everybody to vote. So, so you, your concept is that it's, it's in the document. I would the, think, the I would think, you, yeah, right? which Mr. Kanapka said he gave to you. Is that correct, by the way? I don't have them. Okay. And by the way, if he gave them to me, it wouldn't have anything. They should be submitted to the oh, no, I'm just, development set, but I don't I was just did. surprised he gave them, because as yeah. you've said, Mike, you're not even going to look at them anyway. I wouldn't, because right. I can't rule on them. I'm not going to interpret So why document. should we rule on that? If you're you not going to rule on them. Oh. I thought you sort of said we needed to decide whether we wanted that. I think he's saying we need, need to, to make a recommend. I thought Campbell. you were, just to clarify, I thought you were, well, number one, I think as a board, we can only make recommendations, correct? Right. So I think what you were suggesting is that we, as a board, make a recommendation in this area. Is that correct? It would be a recommend. So the, the recommendation I was suggesting that you make is that in the code, it says, a completed application shall be signed by all owners or their agent of the property subject to the proposal and notarized. Okay. I'll go on, but signatures no, no, but by so, other parties will fine. be accepted only with notarized proof of authorization by the owners. So I think the chair is great. You're just asking us to say whether we agree with does, Does this the application code, apply with that code element? Right. right. Does it okay. say that 
Is it notarized? Right. By. But wait a minute. So one, step back one second. You just read, if I'm reading it correctly, that if the allowance that there's one, you know, allowed or whatever that can sign for all, then we have to have a document that's notarized that said all people agree to that. Basically, no, can you read that again? It, the code says, okay, a completed application mm -hmm. shall be signed by all owners or their agent, their agent. of okay. the property subject to the proposal and notarized. Okay, now I the see what you're saying. Okay. The application is signed by the president of this property owners association mm -hmm. and notarized. Mm -hmm. But the code says Before, it should be all. No, it says all owners or their agent. The president of the association has also given us a notarized document saying, I am their agent and it has been designated to me by corporate resolution, essentially, by a board meeting that we had that voted and all owners authorized me pursuant to our internal documents. And as Campbell Rich pointed out, some associations say that the president can sign if it's just to hire the lawn man. Other associations say the president can sign if it's to do demolition and modifications. And they all read differently. And so it depends on Mm -hmm. what the internal entitlement structures say. But the city of Stewart has a document from this POA yeah. that said it had a special meeting and its internal documents authorize them to dedicate or assign this responsibility to the president and that the president has now signed and has authorized us to move forward. Now, the question is, okay, well, what happens if they're lying? Yeah, yeah. What burden of proof is required it's that not, there's the air The burden of document? proof is that we have that. That's not us. We, we don't have to. It doesn't we, have anything we, to do with us. I'm telling you, it's 100% true that that happened. And they're here. We can talk about it until oh, yeah, the yeah. sun sets. That happened. The question is, what happens now? Because we now have one member of it saying, no, the POA documents don't yeah. say that so from my perspective we don't get to solve their poa documents just as when mr rich talked about the other associations he's members of have different authorities and stuff that is internally and if you're in a limited partnership or a poa or a <laughs> shareholders meeting or a company oh, sorry I'm on the on a gasket. <laughs> um, anyway, the um, if you're in in a meeting like that and you have a derivative claim because you have an interest in it or you are a indirect privity, your remedy may be spelled out in it that you have to go to arbitration first. But I don't know because I don't have the document. Or it may be that you need to file a circuit court action and seek an injunction to prevent them from moving forward at all. Or that you need to file a circuit court for breach of contract or for breach of or for damages or, or, or whatever it is. Now, the peril and risk is that I tell Aaron, look, I read the code and I say to myself, okay, well, what's the code say? And the code says we need a completed application to move forward to the LPA. And I have a completed application and it needs to be notarized, it's notarized by all owners or their agent. And I have an affidavit from this president saying, I'm the designated agent, so I have the authority to do this, and I'm moving forward. And so then I say, well, how can I tell them no, they can't move forward? So we say, okay, they, they can move forward. And then it's evolved until we get in front of you guys, and now the issue is, well, they're asking you guys to decide whether or not one side or the other is right on their internal documents, and mm -hmm. I don't want you to do that. I only want you to decide what has the policy of the city been met? Did the city obtain a complete application signed by all owners or their agent? Signatures by other parties will be accepted only with a notarized proof of authorization by the owners. In the case of corporate ownership, the authorized signature shall be accompanied by a notation of the signer's 
office in the corporation and embossed with the corporate seal, a concept plan may be submitted, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Waters is here. He, he obviously is the one that's on behalf of the applicant. You may want to ask the applicant to go on record of saying, yeah, we, we, we had the meeting and we have authority from all owners to, to go forward. And because the, the and, and then if there's a dispute between the two as to whether or not they really have that authority, I don't want that to be your dispute because I don't think it's appropriate mm -hmm. for you guys to carry the burden of that dispute. And so the, the, my feeling was, look, I want to, I can't, I can't block anybody from coming to the meeting because I interpret it one way or the other. And I also know that historically we have in fact accepted mm -hmm. these assignments. So my purpose for letting it go forward today was to, to let them present the, it's twofold, let them present the hearing at the same time. Honestly, I was hoping they'd work it out between them before the hearing and that didn't happen. But, but since we're here, we may want to address and resolve it first on the whole issue of the continuance because that matters first. I agree. And and then, you know, and I, please don't kick the can down the road just for the sake of that because it will still come back. So <laughs> but, are I, one question I do want to say is so are you saying his statement as far as you know is accurate that he did only receive knowledge 45 minutes before of this? I, I want the city to clarify this one, please. I I just want to make. Never, I just want to make sure that that's. I have never <laughs> had him lie to me before. Okay. No, no, no. No, I just wanted to make sure that, like you said, that I just want to go on record and say yes, he did. You know, only. I, I, when he says that to me, I totally. I mean, honestly, I don't. I don't. No. Did you know before this? Are you making it up? No, I didn't say it that way. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. So, yeah, I can, I can clarify this a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, I called Mr. Kanopka uh, about an hour before the meeting to see if he had a presentation prepared so that way I could upload it to the system. And that was the first time he had heard of the meeting. The development department had not reached out to him and the city clerk has been out sick with COVID. So okay. it is possible, very possible, okay. that he did That's not receive no until my phone good. call. So I think he could handle it either way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I think before you vote on a continuance, which I think Mr. Mortel is saying you pretty much have to grant to avoid a quasi-judicial uh, due, due process, process issue. But before you consider that, because so. uh, you're going to come back on this, and I'll be here making the same arguments, but I just want to agree with most of everything that Mr. Mortel just said, other than a couple right. things, which I'm gonna, I want to highlight these for you to think about for the next meeting. So the language which, which Mike read back is really important. Completed application shall be signed by all owners subject to the change or their agent, right? The POA is not the agent for an owner for purposes of this kind of application. They cannot stand up and say that they have received an assignment from the owner, right? So when, when Mr. Mortel says, we have, we have permitted assignments of authority in the past, 100% agree with that, and you should continue to accept assignments. Those assignments have to say that the assignor is the owner. And the assignee can then stand up and say whatever, like I could be my client's assignee. And I often stand up and represent my client in court, in hearings. I am here for the owner. I could not do that for the property owners association if they're not my client and they haven't assigned me that right. So when, when Mike says we accept assignments, absolutely you should accept assignments, but it needs to be an assignment from the owner, not from the POA. And it can't be a POA representative standing up here saying that we represent the owner. The POA does not represent the owner. That's a separate entity. And the POA has certain rights, which you really don't need to, as Mike said, involve yourself with. But the bottom line is the POA is not the assignee. And I think Mr. Waters will ready, readily admit that. And I think if you look at his letter, or the letter from the POA, and if you could pull that up. Yeah, sure. I don't think it says we hereby represent all of the property owners, including Stewart Hills Lodge LLC, who have given us the authority to submit this application. But that authority may be in the bylaws. That's not what your, that's not what your city 
code allows, though, right? So your city code gives Why aren't you, you in court, Mr. Knopf? <laughs> Why are you asking you, us to make these? <laughs> because you, your, your job is really to advise the city commission on what the code allows and doesn't allow, and it's, it's plain. It says the owner or the owner's agent. So if you can get Mr. Waters to say that he is the agent for Stewart Hills Lodge LLC, then you might have a dispute about the facts because I'm denying that. But I don't think Mr. Waters can stand up here and say I am the assignee for okay. this owner. Okay, not to cut you off, but before we go, because if we discuss and decide that there should be a continuance, because of the, t the notification issue, I would hate, because as you said, you're going to come and tell us the exact same information so we don't have to listen to it right now, basically. So, <laughs> before we do anything else, um, can we please have a discussion on if we would like to grant a continuance? Well, at least you had to let Scott and Jim, the applicant now, at least there's a record here, so we got it. Okay. Okay. This is going to be bigger than us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll still be with us. <laughs> So we, we would object to any continuance. Mm -hmm. Our obligation is to post the property and to notify all property owners. We posted the property on November 24th. We sent notice to all property owners, including the, 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 the property owner whose representative here is today. We provided notice. Whether or not that notice trickled down to their attorney, that's not our problem. And that is not grounds to grant a continuance because there was a lack of communication on their side. There's a big, been a big blue sign out in front of the property for two plus weeks now. People have had notice now for two plus weeks. If that wasn't communicated, that's not grounds for a continuance. The fact that their attorney wasn't told by their client or anyone else until the, the, an hour before this hearing, that's not grounds to continue them. We, we want and we need a decision, good or bad, right or wrong. We need to move forward to the city commission. There is no reason to continue it because a lack of communication on, you know, the intervener side. So I would ask you not to grant the continuance to continue this discussion about compatibility with the area and whether or not we had the authority to apply and proceed with this, this application. No, we, we, I mean, no, what, I mean, what, man, what constitutes, the the board. Yeah, yeah, what constitutes notice, Mike? You tell, I mean, what's well, the legal? What's and, the yes, so, that's. There, there's a minimum notice, which is the, the, the posting and the due process and the hearing took place, and I, I don't doubt that they got notice of that because they intervened. So they wouldn't have filed an intervention if, in fact, they didn't get the notice of the issue and the stuff. I mean, I, I don't think that's an issue at all. What, what caused me to have a little concern was the fact that they did intervene mm -hmm. and that as the intervener, The city contacted them today and said, are you going to be submitting in, in, uh, anything for the, for the hearing? And, and, and ironically, that, I mean, that happens before where people don't. I mean, it, so it's not that that's crazy, unheard of, or that, that that's never happened before. But, and I, I believe there's even a letter. I don't know if it's the intervener letter in the, in the thing if, or if it's just an objection letter um, in the agenda item. I don't have the um, intervener letter in my, but yeah, it's November 5th is the objection letter. I don't know the date of the intervener letter. So the, the intervener letter to the city clerk was November 30th, enclosed police finance firms check in the amount of $400, which represents application for intervener status. Please find a copy of the application letter from Mr. Kanopka dated November 5th with our application. So the November 5th letter is what's in your agenda, so I'm not going to read it all the way back into the record because it doesn't matter. But I do know that they did pay money to the clerk of the city on November 30th, which, again, I, I don't know the specific dates here, but I also know that the clerk has been out mm -hmm. since Thanksgiving. 
do they get to meet? Uh, so is it automatic that someone is granted intervener status, or do they have to get approval? Like, would the a clerk have had to notify them that their application for status intervener. has been I, approved? They, that has happened. The clerk's assistant, Suse, accepted their check. I'm sure it's been cashed. Okay, so as but soon as that a, happens, it's accepted? Is that the way it's looked at? Or do they need to have official notification? Do you see there what I'm is saying? No, there, is no, there is no order or form or anything. We, they don't wait to another hearing to have the board accept their status as intervener. It's no different than an application. When the applicant drops the check off, they've dropped off the application. So the application for intervener was dropped off on what looks like November... It's, it's actually dated November 9th, but it was the letter was dated November 30th. I, I know that it, the city got it because the, the staff is handing it to me. Mm -hmm. um, so it happened after Thanksgiving, but before this hearing. So, you know, there's, there's technical rules on how many days prior to a hearing you have to intervene as well as far as following the code is concerned, but I think it's five or something like that, so I think they're probably ahead of the five days. And I don't know that there's any magic one way or the other as far as what difference it would have made as far as this LPA hearing is concerned if somebody called them yesterday to remind them of the hearing or today to remind them of the hearing. I just heard him say it, and it... Mm -hmm. made me concerned. At the same time, I recognize uh, Mr. Waters' concern that they do want to process the thing and everybody wants to move as quickly as they can. Um, but at the same time, I, I, and, and for what it's worth, I did say don't kick the, down, don't kick the can down the road just because I'm bringing it up because I'm not suggesting to do that. And I do promise you that it's not going to disappear. <laughs> the problem isn't going to resolve itself. Um, so, so I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth on which way you should, how you should rule or not. There's also one other option, and I, and I, I'm going to get in trouble when I do this. Watch her give me the evil eye. There's also the, hey, we're going to call a. Is it was this wasn't going to be on the December 13th meeting anyway, was it? January 10th. So, the this board could ask for a special meeting. And just hear this matter next week on whatever day, Thursday. If, see, like, you know, so for, so for what it's worth, and I see you guys cringing too, but I, I mention it just because that's also an option. I'm not, you know, rather than kicking this hearing till February, because if they can't be heard before the January 13th meeting and then it makes it so it can't be heard till the February meeting, that there's other solutions other than that, which would give them an opportunity to be heard. And it may... Um, I mean, because I think first, it, it will be my position that I'm going to ask whoever's going to testify on behalf of the applicant, did you have the authority of the property owners to submit the application? The answer, I'm assuming, is going to be yes. And then what are you going to do with that? Because now the application's in front of you. Now you have to address it on its merits anyway. And if, if, the, if the owner of the hotel says that person is, if they say no, it's easy too, because we're done and we're out the door, right? Nope, we didn't. Okay, done. I doubt that's going to happen. I assume it's going to be yes. And then we have to move forward on the process of the application and hear the hearing. And then whether you grant it or deny it, the hotel person still has the remedy of addressing the fact that they didn't, that they usurped the language of their property owners association if in fact it didn't authorize that to occur and they probably should address it anyway even if you denied the, the approval because it's going to come up again for them on another level somewhere along the way and, and you probably shouldn't let the board do things that they're not authorized to otherwise do. But, but that's not our issue. And the issue for us is this hearing before us today, and did they have notice of this hearing? Yes, to the extent that they knew it was occurring. Did Mr. Kanafka know it was today? Clearly he didn't, but again, is that does it matter? I don't know. That's your guys' discretion. Okay. Ryan, did, were you had something that you would like to say? Uh, I, I didn't. I forgot. Um, 
So I'm going to I'm going to just throw out some of my thoughts. It, it's obviously complex. I think um, and maybe I can ask a question to the applicant. Is the does it is a property purchased or under contract? It's under contract. Okay. Past due diligence. Past due diligence. So um, typically in that due diligence period is when you look at PUD documents, look at acceptable use, and know that you're taking on a risk if you're going to take a use that's not applicable. That's, that's, that's my first thing. Go ahead. Can I answer? So we did that. Uh, back in April, the first time staff was engaged, and the response from staff was, yes, it's a permitted use. You can do that on this piece of property. So we moved forward in reliance on that, and then I think additional staff looked at it again, because so we, we went to staff and said, is this a permitted use? Yes, it is. You can do what you want to do. Go ahead and submit your development applications, meaning your building permits and things like that. So that's what we did, and that's when staff, a, a different staff, looked at it, started the review and said, wait a minute, oh, no, wow. you can't do this. And so by that point, we were, we were kind of locked in and, and Interesting. Okay. Pretty, pretty deep into this. And so we've, we've been working, and s s staff, to their credit, has worked very close, closely with us, really helped us out through this whole process. But we did do our due diligence up front and just got some incorrect information that we unfortunately relied on, and that's why we're here today again. We started in April, thought we'd be done by May or June, and it's December and we're... Okay, thanks, Tyson. Um, I think, Mike, there's maybe a difference between a POA in a Hammock Creek versus a CPUD POA in the sense that, it, it, and maybe it's just the scale of the POA in the PUD when it's a six lot PUD it's it's kind of difficult to see that there's one unit in that PUD that doesn't agree with a change in a CPUD and can then be hurt by the other PUD members because of a change in the PUD that they initially agreed to. So um, I understand the fact that, you know, POA, voting, how that goes down. It appeared from that letter it was a super majority of the vote, meaning the lodge voted against it, and the other members voted for it, I'm assuming. My, my opinion is they could either do it or they couldn't. They either, have, they either have the legal authority to do it or they don't. If they don't, it's invalid. And if we they don't do, it's valid. And yeah. we don't require proof of their legal authority, well, like documents saying this is what grants us the authority. We're taking it on their word. The, I mean, they signed an affidavit, and, and by the okay. way, every meeting, they get up, every meeting, an applicant gets up in front of you and says, we mailed notice to the people 300, within 300 feet of this application, and we don't require them to subpoena those people and bring them in the room and testify that they mailed the letter to them. The evidence presented is from them. The applicant's under oath. The remedy is that if someone lied or breached the, the, the POA document, then the remedy is the internal, because by the way, the, the granting or denying of this application today does not, by the way, ever, even if you did grant it, they're not building a building. It's a use. It's not, the construction is not going to put a high rise in this location. So if in fact it was illegal what they what authority they have or don't have, the remedy would be that they could get a a, a circuit court injunction or years ago on Jensen Beach Boulevard they they violated the land use and it took four or five years and the developer built the buildings and the residents moved into the townhouses and when the fourth district court of appeal ruled that no they didn't have the authority to do it judge shack ordered them to demolish the townhouses and they took them down and it, it, they went away i mean it, I'm, i hate to, I, and by the way my letter to 
the applicant was, look, we'll let this case go forward to the board, but you're doing it at your own risk and your own peril because if you don't have that authority, the mere fact that we're putting it before the LPA by no means is a, is a, is a ruling by the city that you do. It's just we're relying on your statement that you do and giving you the due process that you're entitled to as a member of the community to be heard. It's, it, that's it. So they either have the authority to do it or they don't, and I don't know. So this type of use is allowed in CPUD, MXPUD, and industrial? The, the future land use is this type of use would be allowed to be there but for the fact that it's not listed as a use allowed in this PUD document. Them, if they amended the PUD document to allow the use, the city's code says on US-1 in this location, in the commercial and the whatever future land use is, gotcha. you can have auto repair inside a building. So. The city code on US-1 at that location, but for the PUD, would allow this type of use to move forward. The PUD that was adopted, and I don't know what year, and it's been amended a couple of times, um, has a list that says the following uses are permitted. It, now, if it had a list that said the following uses are prohibited, you know, it might be even a different interpretation, but it doesn't matter. It's not an allowed use. Right. It's not, it doesn't say it in the PUD document. In order for it to be an allowed use, the PUD has to be amended, which leads you to how do you amend a PUD? Well, you go to the code. The code says to amend a PUD, you need the signature of all owners. And so, if in fact, ironically, let's, let's, I, I don't get close to Mike, but hypothetically speaking, it used to be a, a goodwill, and honestly, I don't know what goodwill is, but I don't know if the PUD says you can do goodwill. But, but let's say the goodwill building had a problem and they needed to, to modify the building, and whatever they needed to do to modify the building required a PUD amendment, and the landowner for that property for the goodwill building was going to get a $500 a day code enforcement fine until they fixed whatever that was. and and. It required the signature of all owners. And somebody said, oh, now, you know, I, I'll give you a signature, but I want you to give me half your land. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what we would do under those circumstances. I don't think it would be possible for us to code enforce them under that because it would be an impossibility of performance. But the, we've run into this signature thing many times in the past. and. We've talked about changing it, but everybody says, no, it's not. You shouldn't change it. You leave it there. The signatures, as Mr. Konopka said, it's a property right. It's a vested property right. The, you, you should be able to rely on it, and that's true. Along with that vested property right that was created contractually is in the ordinance. It says and they're going to have a, a POA or an HOA or, or, or whatever their association's management rights are. And it's going to regulate whatever it regulates. And in this case, I think, and I haven't you know, jumped into it, but my understanding of tonight's discussion was that Mr. Kanaka's position is that that POA document was intended for and created to disperse the equitable costs of common area maintenance and to hire the lawn man kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but that it was not intended to be used for the scope of changing the authority on signatures to modify the PUD. On the other hand, the alternative argument or discussion is, well, no, the board has, the, P, the, the, the owners or the members of the POA have the right to amend the POA, and they had a duly held meeting, and they've amended the POA, and the POA now does, in fact, authorize the signature. So to me, I, I, I know that legally I could create a POA and have members of a POA and I could call a duly held meeting and I could amend the PUA, POA 
And I could, in fact, have it adopt binding language that authorized the POA to operate with that language moving forward. I mean, I, I, that's pretty common. I mean, it happens every single day of the week. Now, I don't know if it did or didn't, and I don't get to decide anyway, so it doesn't matter what I read. The question is, we have an applicant that comes before us that says we have the legal authority to do it. We sent the notice to the people within 300 feet. We've signed the notarized application. We followed up with the notarized document saying we had the legal authority to sign on behalf of the people because we had a specially held meeting, and here it is. And we're here to want to present, present it to you. We then have another member of it. And I know it feels weird because it's small, because it's only three. If it was 3,000 and it was only one person objecting, we might ignore them. But I don't know that that makes any difference at all. The number doesn't matter. If it's 3,000 or three, one objection is enough. If it's, it's either allowed or it's not. And so my thought on it is, well, I can't tell them they can't come to a hearing. I can't tell the other side that I can bar, you know, it, so I'm stuck to let it go forward to you guys as a board. But I don't want you to really get caught up in the issue, that issue. I'd much rather say to you, ignore that issue altogether, have the hearing, and just tell us what your thoughts are on this application. Unfortunately, it's somewhat intertwined. And because you're not binding, your ruling as it relates to the, um, the, to the approval of it doesn't grant any property rights or take any property rights away. If anything, if you're inclined to go forward on the hearing, I, I, I might have you, if there is a motion, say something to the effect of, without discussing this issue at all or assuming they had the ability to be before us because we don't get to decide that. This is how we feel about this particular use. Or if we had all the signatures, this is what our position would be on this use, maybe something to that effect. Or continue it, move it on, or call a special meeting, or whatever you want to do. I don't want to. I don't want to put words in your mouth and tell you what to do. I just. It, Oh, I've been Madam, around the city for a long time. We've never had this problem before. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. I mean, he did ask us to for continuance. I think we should at least vote on that. Yeah, I would agree. So, so I'd okay, like to make a motion okay. that um, <laughs> that we grant a continuance due to insufficient notice, according to Mr. Can Kana. I can I ask one question before? Am I allowed to do that? One question. Well, now that we that need a motion sure. second, then we can. Right? Okay. Is there a second? I mean, so. we also have a public comment right. for this item too. So, so we, we don't need, need to get public... into this whole matter if we're not if we're going to continue it. So let's just take care of that one way or the other. Well, I think they need to speak on the item itself, right? right. Well, no matter what, you'll take the public comment. But we've got a motion without a second on right. the floor. Would anybody like to second the motion? Okay. Okay, so motion dies. Is so that the way that works? Now, do you guys have the discretion yeah. to take the public comment or to continue your discussion until such time as you're inclined to take the public comment? And if there's never another motion, you don't have to take public comment because there's nothing to take it for. But there is public comment out there. Sometimes the board wants to hear what they want to say. Okay, why don't we go ahead with the public comment? Uh, just before we do that, I, so I, I wanted to do one more thing with my presentation is just submit the the actual property owners association documents that I referred to earlier. Can I just submit those into the record? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I think it's already part of the packet. So, That's right. I mean, I object just to this, that he's already given his presentation, and we're kind of in this, we've gone all back and forth. I don't think now's the time to put more information in. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even sure what, I thought you were putting the letter. No, that's the POA. Okay. Please, sir, come to the microphone. Hello. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeremiah Hayhurst. I'm a project architect with Mathers Engineering. Full disclosure, I've worked with Bill for about 25 years. I've also done work for Suburban Lodge about six months ago when a car hit the, uh, the building on the, on the ground floor. 
And I've also had my car painted by Collision Depot, did a good job. <laughs> so I want to let you know that I've been a town park resident for 16 years. And I was a board member for eight of those. And of the board, I was also the president of the board for four of those years. My concern today, if you could maybe pull up the third slide. I live in building 803. This one? No, let's see, keep going, with this the aerial shot. This one? Yeah, next one. Yours? Yes, I'll just point to And at that time, Goodwill had lots of, um, lots of issues. As board president, we had a homeless issue. People living in those trees in the back there. The trees weren't maintained very well. We as a board had to cut the trees on our side of the wall. We also had an issue with the trees with Suburban because they also, we had to, you know, they, they, you know it's always an issue of trees on one side of the property to the other. My, my, my goal here is that the trees are, are a great sound attenuation. And we got to make sure that they're not cut or anything's done to those during the process, during the, any of the, the work that's proposed. Is Maybe a tree survey would be a good idea for the, the city to have under a survey to actually, so two years from now they can't say, oh, these trees have been here, they were cut down. That would be one of my suggestions. Another suggestion I have is I'm not either for or against the project. Again, I would like to have the building the, the, the garage doors be insulated. There's also a, an idea of when the, the, the garage doors are up and down, who's going to maintain that policing of that? Okay. Maybe a 24 hour camera is looked. Something has to be done because, as a, a former president of the board, we would always get nuisance complaints from suburban police calls, things of that nature. Yes. It's a, uh, a hotel, but we've been there, and I've had this unit for 16 years. My other issue is, of the 96 unit owners of Town Park, 60 of them are elderly. They're retired. Building 804, 803 face less than 100 yards away from this post. So I'd like to re recommend heavy duty light shielding, okay, where we would have at least some nighttime no light pollution coming onto our property. I'm not sure what the new lighting plan is going to call for, the new codes, because when, the, when uh, 15, 18 years ago when Goodwill was built, the codes were changed. So if that could be something that could be uh, put into a recommendation on my part, not as just as a, a private citizen. The sound attenuation for the machinery is also something I would recommend. Vibration isolation, because they have lots of machines and things Sir, of that nature. you can have another 30 seconds. Okay. So, my, my enforcement issue is how do you make sure that the garage doors stay closed? Okay, it's great to say that in a meeting, great to have it in something, but, you know, most of these places you can drive by, they're always open. So, the only way you're going to have the sound attenuation is if the, there's some enforcement on the garage doors. And I'd like to have them insulated. That's my only comments for, for uh, the staff. Um, I hope you guys work it out. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I would love for us to have a little discussion before yes, we hear any more I agree. from either I side. I agree. No, not right now. We're going to discuss first. Please wait. Just want to say we have this here. Not okay. It. Thank you. Okay. Let's have a discussion. I think the first, foremost, the only question that we should be asking ourselves right now is, do we feel that it is appropriate for a notarized letter from the POA to count as a sort of, you know, like an, an owner's agreement in this situation. I think we should just remove all of the particulars of this specific complicated situation and say, in general, is that okay? If it's not, if, if there's something nefarious going on, that's for the courts to decide. We're just, I'm a dum-dum, I can't make that decision. So do we feel like it's appropriate for them to have submitted this letter from the POA. I think that's just, the, I'd like to have that conversation. Okay. Does anybody have any comment they would like to make on that? Well, Mike says, and staff, I know staff says it's sufficient. 
I think it's that's and that's it. That's all we know, Jackie. Right? Yeah. So maybe so. this is, can be a lot less complicated. I, and then I think we have to go on to decide if this is appropriate. Yes. But I would like, I mean, can we just? I, for what it's worth, this is a classic judicial hearing. The applicant has the burden to prove that they're entitled to your vote in an affirmative measure. What I would want if I was sitting on the board is testimony that put record evidence, not what we learned off, because I haven't, I'm not under oath, and I'm not, a, I'm not telling you that I did the letter or did anything. I think the applicant, if in fact you go forward with the hearing, you have to call a witness and you have to say, we had authority, we had the meeting, or you know, put that evidence in the, in, mm -hmm. uh, put this letter mm -hmm. in that evidence, because this gives us the authority, so that it is on the record that they, because right now it's me and Aaron that own it, right? Because we're not, no one else put this evidence on. Yeah. So I think they should, and if so they're going to do that, they should come forward, put somebody on the under oath, testify, we did it, the meeting happened, we have the authority, that's why we're here, and this is what we want. Okay, so is this considered a hearing right now? Yes. Without a doubt, there's <laughs> okay. been a hearing I just, about an hour. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. I just want to confirm that. Now, I agree with that statement. Does anybody else have comment? Would we oh, like I would. Uh, I, um, you keep telling us. Sorry, you keep telling us two different things, Mike. I thought your other suggestion was simpler. We can make a motion, say we approve this, uh, based on our belief that the application is sufficient and that the letter from the whomever that one is valid, legal. No, no, no. But you know what I'm saying based on our belief okay, that that, it's, that it is legal, we approve it based, you know, with these uh, additions or stipulations. I think you could do that. I would and like to have somebody on record during the hearing saying that there was a meeting that took place. It is within the HOA documents that that representative is allowed to represent. I would like that on record officially. That's not going to happen tonight, then, right? I don't know that that witness is here to submit that. But okay. They can, they can identify it in the record. I just can hold up and say, look, we submitted it to Aaron or whatever Aaron got. And or if you want that, though, then you're going to need to address it if that's your thing. What Mr. Rich is talking about saying is we're not even going to address it. We're going to say, hey, we're just going to address what they're trying to do, assuming now I'm going to give to the commission that you guys get to address that. And you guys can decide whether it's good or bad. We're not going to take evidence on whether it's in the record or not. We intentionally didn't address it. And all we addressed was the potential use. That issue is still reserved for the city commission to treat as if it has not been presented. Madam Chair, I, I agree with you. I would like to. And in fact, it says in the application, it says the staff questions the validity of the application be filed on behalf of the PUD. However, as the POA has voted in favor and supports the application, the city attorney has deemed this request should be heard in front of the city commission. Board I member Give the applicant time then to prepare to, so that testimony will be made available to the city. Otherwise, I don't, I, tonight you're kind of, I don't know what happens. Board Member Rich, I just wanted to clarify that was in the staff report that I wrote. Right. So yeah, part of your yeah, yeah. packet. Mm -hmm. So you're recommending that we, you didn't say we want the LPA to deal with this. You said the city commission should determine the validity of this dispute or determine. Yes, staff has had dispute. the question on the validity. Yes. Okay. So that would, I would, I totally agree with you, but let's Pivot. push the responsibility yeah. okay. to the city commission. And then that gives them time to prepare, right? So can we, if we make a re recommendation on this, can we have that as part of the recommendation? So like you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Then I'm fine with that. I okay. just want somewhere like your recommendation that there's somebody that certifies under oath to their ability to do this. And staff agrees with that. Good. Okay, great. <laughs> Is there any other discussion that we want to have on the, mo on what's before us. Questions, 
Now, by the way, well, there's so no motion. What I understand, you, there was a motion continuance that died. Therefore, you then went to the next issue of this application thing, and you resolved it to say, we're not addressing that tonight. So now we've reached the merits. The meeting is starting. <laughs> I'm kidding. There was presentations by both attorneys. It was focused more on the, the nuance, and I don't know if you want to give them both an opportunity, one or two minutes, just to re rebut the issues of no, we're good. fences, no, sound barriers, we are good. or anything. We're, okay. so we are, I think that... Don't ask me. Good. Okay. You guys know what you want to okay. do. I do like the suggestions made by a adjacent um, owner that if we do choose to pursue this, that adding in some of the things as he suggested in the tree survey to make sure that everything is documented properly should be done. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I agree. He's going to really like the second item on our agenda tonight, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, okay. it's enforcement for trees. On, oh, there you go. Well, um, okay. Would anyone like the attorneys to do the rebuttal? No, here, amongst us. <laughs> okay, I do not. Anybody else? No. Great. Okay. Can I ask yes. some questions of? Yes, that's my next thing. Was Let's ask the questions about the specific project before us. Mr. Kanapka. Yes, Mr. Rich. Um, so that's a very lengthy list of allowed uses, right? It is. And you read that. So what is what is it that's unique about this business? It's not retail. What it's elements not would be present there that are n n would not be present in so many of those different uses, possible well, usages? If, you dr if you've driven by the collision depot um, off of US-1 to the south, you'll see there's cars in the parking lot. You'll see there's, um, there's noise emanating from the property. Mm -hmm. There's banging hydraulic machines. There are um, engines revving. Uh, you'll hear none of that next to a retail establishment or a professional establishment or an assisted living facility or a doctor's office or a lawyer's office. So uh, the, the, the extensive list of uses illustrate that this was carefully thought of, that the uses were considered by the people who bought into that P CPUD, and that industrial type uses were not a part of their consideration for good reason. So you, you, cast a very skeptical eye on their assertion promise that, that everything will be done indoors and the doors closed and I, I think there will the be cars. cars will not be parked there at night, correct? Isn't I, it? There's no enforcement of that right going forward, so they can promise you the world here today and the code doesn't require a collision depot to put their cars inside and to keep their bays closed. They're going to want their bays open. Their lights are going to be shining down in the parking lot to prevent thefts and break-ins. And it's going to be nothing like the, the retail type uses that are in the CPUD. So you simply don't believe their claims. You're saying that the practical matter is that's not how they'll run their business. They may have every belief that that's what will happen. They're not going to be running the collision depot. They're not going to be the ones flipping the switch to, to turn the lights on and off to close the bay doors, to open the bay doors, to decide what keys to leave in the parking lot, to decide what to do with the cars that they haven't been able to fix that night and the owners who haven't come to pick up those cars. There will be nowhere left but to leave them in the parking lot overnight. And so, then they're gonna need to protect them and there's gonna be chain link fences up, right? Because that's what the application says. They're gonna have a chain link fence surrounding this property. That's an eyesore. So Kev, is there a means of enforcement that the city undertakes? Well, yeah, there's, uh, if this is part of the conditions of the PUD, then that's what will be enforced. Mm -hmm. but is uh, the city does sound monitoring at, okay. yeah, if it's needed. Um, the city will monitor the, Im the implications of the conditions of the PUD, and that's why we have conditions on PUDs. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, I got a quick question for you. On the uh, CPUD, these parcels are all tied together, right? They all, they, yes. 
They're all part of a CPUD, yes. Okay, so they're tied together. And co they have common property, uh, common area. Right, but wouldn't the violation of one then jeopardize the total? Uh, essentially, yes. So if, you know, uh, if there was a violation, then it's the total CPOD that would end up being some type of responsibility. I always thought, even though we had multi-disciplines uh, within a PUD, that a violation was the uh, violation of the PUD agreement, which is the master. This is a uh, subcondition of the master CPUD, correct? It's unusual in that there are sub subparts of the PUD highlighted with different uses attached to them. However, the overall PUD is, is controlled by or managed by a property owner's association. Any right. violation on that would be issued to the property owner's right. association. So it's not just the city, it's there's an association that's supposed to also monitor it for uh, yes. the, the original CPUD, right? Yes. Okay. I disagree with that. I don't think the association has any role in monitoring the CPUD. And that's now in the record. You can look at that. But that's not the association's role. They cut the grass. They collect assessments. They make sure the common property and access is there. That, that okay. Well, Guys, <laughs> hold up. <laughs> the PUD ordinance would probably delineate whatever that responsibility is. Whatever it says, it says. Okay. Thank you. We have other questions. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kanaka. Thank you. Mr. Waters. So the barrier between the hotel, the ex extended stay, and what sort of buffering There's are we contemplating? Are we willing to? I mean, we're, we're maintaining what's existing here. So I think um, to the west of the property, there's a very large landscape buffer that kind of goes a little bit further to the south past the parking. Um, and then right in front of the building, there's a little uh, island of, of trees and landscape. And then again, your buffer is, you know, 100 plus or feet between building to building. Can we do something more there? Well, there's not a whole lot of room because, again, what we're looking to do is just inherit an improved site. And so I think everything off of our property is common area. And that's maintained by this association. And, and it's very lush, and as you pointed out, I mean, <laughs> as, as one of the, the public speakers <coughs> pointed out, I mean, right now this, this parcel is vacant, and it's being used for questionable purposes. The, land, the, the buffer is being used, and I think if you look, the it's a frequent development that's visited by the police. I mean, I think that there are already issues and already a heavy, heavy monitoring of this development. And I think at the end of the day, this property hopefully is going to turn the corner and, and help with the redevelopment improvement of this entire development. But I, I, I do, if I can just digress a little bit. Very short. Very shortly, because I'm just responding to a, a question by Mr. Mathers about the enforcement. For what you tend to have are a global PUD that if you violate this global PUD, then yes, it's an enforcement against everyone. But then you start seeing these site-specific amendments like this, where it only applies to a certain parcel, like a site plan that only applies to a certain par property. So if I violate my site plan, everyone else doesn't get in trouble, I get in trouble. And that goes back to this issue of the subject property. When you have these site-specific amendments, it's the subject property is only the property that's described in there. Everyone else has the chance to talk, but but so an enforcement of if we violate this PUD amendment, it's a violation against this property. It doesn't affect Suburban Lodge. It doesn't affect the bank or whatever the next use is going to be, and it doesn't affect the association. It affects this site-specific, the property that's subject to this application only. Okay. Campbell, do you have any other questions? Yeah, the, the area, that island, that front US-1 is a really nice piece there. Do you have the aerial? I mean, that could really have some very nice and uh, uh, landscaping in it. I don't know what the... We can do it on the boat. 
plan for that is, but that could be very attractive, really. Yeah. It's a big piece. I don't. Are you just doing the minimum asked for by staff, or do you have plans for something else? No, I else? think we're, we're trying to just enhance the, the landscaping that was already there by adding and moving a couple of, of bushes. But really, our idea was not to, to really modify the site plan, site plan too much, because we thought this was going to be a very straightforward. And Board Member Rich, I do want to clarify that staff did ask for additional landscaping. Excuse me? Staff has asked for additional landscaping, oh, good. but that, that was not provided. Um, the gentleman brought up, and I do, I, I suffer from this in my own neighborhood, some of these very bright highlights can be very intrusive. Is there a means of abating, you know, the, the lighting facing the hotel there? So now you've gone beyond my capabilities. Okay, you're right. So, you're right. So <laughs> I'm going to have the applicant okay. come up here and, and he can give more information. Hey, I'm Carson Baird. Um, so father and I are the ones that are developing the property and uh, just wanted to address a couple of the items, one being the concerns of the gentleman in the back. Uh, so currently within four and five, four is a lowland preserve right now, uh, and five is a wooded area that acts as a buffer between us and the apartments. Uh, to confirm his uh, comment about homeless people, we visited the site within the last month and they're still there. Uh, we have no intention of removing any of that barrier. It's not our place. That would be the PUDs anyway. Uh, and as for our landscaping plans, we wanted to keep the site as, as it is currently. And as the landscaping plan was approved way back when, when the Goodwill was first developed, I think in 2004. So uh, Aaron did rec make a rec recommendation to change some of uh, the landscaping or add an additional uh, landscaping buffer in order to address some of uh, you know his comments and I'm sure Suburban Lodge's concerns as well about noise, uh, light, any sort of, you know, pollution that would be affecting either of the properties. Um, one that was mentioned was that the doors are always open at the Collision Depot mom and pop shop down the road. This is going to be occupied by a national publicly traded auto body shop that's putting in uh, well north of three, four, five hundred thousand dollars into the property, including a state-of-the-art AC system. And we live in Florida. It's never a good idea to leave your door open if it's anything 70 degrees outside. Um, and it's a stipulation of our acceptance to keep the doors closed. So uh, the business decision will enforce those doors staying closed. We have no intention of ever leaving them open except to bring a car in or take a car out. Uh, it's a concrete block building as far as noise pollution goes. There's not going to be anything like that except for the odd moment where the door opens up and down. Uh, and as for light, I tend to agree with his suggestion of making sure that if there are any lights on the building, on the property, in the parking lot. We make sure that there's some sort of visor that prevents where that light is going to go, that it's not emitting into somebody's apartment or into the, the suburban lodge residences. So, uh, do, do we have to make a specific stipulation there, Kevin, or Kev, or staff? We do require as a part of the building permit process that a photometric plan be submitted and we can ensure it meets code and any, any light spillover we can ensure that there are cutoffs um, placed on those lights. So we'll just, okay, good. Um, okay, you are, you have a lot of cars coming, so you got a lot of stuff spilling out of those cars. How are you, how are we dealing with, you know, runoff and retention and you probably. In terms of. That's certainly, sort of you know, uh, engine oils and all the stuff that comes off of cars when it rains. And, Covered in environmental phase one, I think, as far as um, you know, coverage for what is coming off of the vehicles, uh, it's it's nothing that you wouldn't have seen at a, a regular service station. If any vehicle is damaged or leaking, anything like that, it's being addressed before it even gets on our site, or if it is, it's being brought inside to address formally because we're held to strict pollution control standards. Do we have to do any sort of additional regulation because of this type of business, Kevin? Um, other than standard building regulations, um, building permit regulations, no. Oh, okay. I was going to say, Sam may know a little bit more about this. He's, uh, he's been in the body shop business for over 30 years, and uh, he could probably talk to you a little bit more about how it's regulated state and federally, uh, which may be where you see those kind of regulations taking place. Do you have any experience? As 
as far as the property goes. Sorry, please state your name for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Sam Baird. I'm the uh, CEO of Collision Craft, which consists of my son and I. So uh, we wish we had never seen the for sale sign on that. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a living nightmare. I have $150,000 tied up in that building, and that, you know, I have no way of charging somebody. But, you know, as my attorney said, back in April, we got a letter. It's our standard uh, operating procedure. Talk to our neighbors and, you know, make sure that the site workable for us and because we have to get a permit to get our tenant in. The tenant has over 850 locations. Some of them used to be mine, but uh, they run their operation like a hospital and they like to be a good neighbor. I would. What was the question? The question was, are there any state environmental or local environmental regulations that have to be abided by? Okay. I'm sorry. I got off That's track. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we're installing a uh, water grit separator, which uh, cleanses all anything in the inside. If we wash a car that we've buffed out or something like that, then it goes through the filter system and then back into the sewer. So you will be abiding by any state regulations regarding environmental practices? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Campbell, I'm anything done. else? Done? Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? I was very quickly, just about the chain link fence. I, I, I hear, you know, I think that it, this feels like a fairly appropriate use for this space if we can get it to fit in with the other types of uses. So it seems like n light and noise pollution, if they, if we can make sure that code enforcement is enforcing that. And then the only other thing that I, I think would kind of fall outside of that is the chain link fence, which you probably would not have around a retail or nursery school or that kind of thing. Um, this is a bit of an eyesore. I don't know if that's something that can be dealt with, but otherwise that's all. It is, it is permitted, a chain link fence is permitted with screening, um, which is what they have provided here. However, we have also asked the applicant to provide above and beyond that, and that was not provided. So if okay. you would like to make that a part of your recommendation. Well, okay. considering how long we've all been here tonight, I'm sure the applicant wouldn't mind putting in a better fence and perhaps some denser landscaping so that we can all get through this. <laughs> love to put trees in the buffer. The trees in the front have been neglected and yeah. the ones close to the building, they're mostly dead. Okay. So be replacing all, there is an existing fence that covers three quarters of the property. We just want to cut off the area at night that is our parking area and uh, where we typically work. And we're, we're out of there by 630. Okay. Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion? I'd like to make a quick statement. Um, obviously, Jerry said, you know, he and I work together. Um, Town Park has been a client of mine for a number of years. Uh, we did the original development back in the 80s. And uh, I'm not retained for them with them at this point in time. Uh, that's why I don't mind taking part in the discussion. Uh, however, there is something coming up that they will be retaining me on, so uh, there's a potential, you know, okay. conflict. So I'll be abstaining in the vote. Does that? Do we have enough of a majority? Yeah. Oh, we have enough. Okay. So we have a quorum. Okay. Fantastic. Now, with the remaining, like to make a motion. 
So are you recusing yourself on this? I'm going to abstain on the vote. Oh, yeah. okay. I'll make a motion to move approval of the um, amendment with um, an improved landscape plan featuring uh, denser, mature landscaping and a fence that is more appropriate in line with the current retail um, character of the property. Um, is it possible to add also the, con the condition that we discussed earlier that it has to be officially on record once it goes before the city commission, what the POA documents say? Well, I, well, I think okay. we want to add is uh, add. with the understanding with the uh, with the uh, <laughs> with the understanding that the representations by the applicant regarding the POA is that how we officially designate Mike are legal and valid. Then Jackie's motion. Okay. Yes. I think that's, yes. Okay. And Jackie, you forgot noise and light abatement. Well, that's all right. It seems like that's co covered. Okay. It's just about enforcement. Okay. okay. Jordan, we have that, you... Jordan? Madam the, Chair. Do we have a Madam second? Chair. Oh, yes. There were other issues mentioned during the, the hearing, and I just want to make sure that before you vote on the motion that you are aware of what other issues were to, spoken about. There were the insulation of the garage doors. Mm -hmm. There was the lighting plans required the sound attenuation of the garage itself, uh, the tree survey of existing um, preserve area. And also, um, as we, did, we heard, that I would suggest adding that any violation of any subsequent approval or amendment of this particular part of the PUD be aimed solely at the owner or operator of this particular parcel. Jackie, would you like to amend your motion to include those items? I would like to do that, yes. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Board Member Rich? Yes. Board Member Strom? Yes. Board Member Mathers? Abstain. Board Member Vitali? Yes. Chair Loreen. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> you're, you're halfway there. Mr. Mathers, we'll be having somebody email you the form B or whatever it is. She'll give it to me before I leave. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the um, second item on the agenda, please. Sure you want to leave? You're Chair, can like we this. take a five-minute um, recess? Just a five-minute? Yes. Thank you. Can take five-minute recess. None of them seem to be working. Okay, there it goes. Um, Tom Reed, senior planner. For the record, I will be quick and concise. Um, this basically the commission asked staff to put together some language to amend the code. Uh, uh, chapter five of the code having to do with resource protection, tree, pen tree penalties specifically. Okay, so there is some history that is involved in tree penalty, pen penalty and our land development code. Way back in 2001, uh, staff uh, put together language similar to what is going, is in front of you tonight uh, uh, for the LPA to consider. Uh, the similar language, as I mentioned, they voted 5-0 to keep a flat penalty of $7,500 <coughs> per violation. Um, currently, however, I don't see where that $7,500 is still in place in the code, and there's nothing in the code for tree penalties. Uh, more history and more recently, trees were removed illegally at the Osprey Preserve Development. Again, no provision in the code for staff to formulate enforced penalties. The developer who removed the trees and vegetation illegally conjured up some, uh, actually didn't conjure it up, but he used the existing mitigation that we have in chapter five uh, 
uh, so it was basically one and a half times the ratio and two and a half on hardwoods. Um, more history that staff considered uh, recently, uh, the, the cost of two trees relocated to Shepherd Park at $13,500 a piece. They were 14 inches in diameter or DBH. Uh, we also considered that in our uh, penalty formulation. So this is basically gives you an idea of what, in, what the amounts were in 2001 for a, uh, a four and a half to six inch DBH diameter at breast height uh, uh, was proposed at $500. We've multiplied everything by five. Uh, and as you gradate up the list, uh, you can see where the 11 to 15 inch variety uh, comes in at 15,000, which is a little bit more than what the trees at uh, Shepherd Park were relocated for. Um, mostly because of the cost of a crane, and that's why it gets more expensive on the bigger trees. Um, so staff feels, uh, in looking at the recent cost for the relocation of those trees, plus a little bit more for a penalty, that the 2021 column is appropriate um, uh, for today, and we would like uh, help the board to consider that. Uh, therefore, we make a motion to recommend the approval of Ordinance 2378-2021, text amendment to Chapter 5, Resource Protections, Standards Contained in the City's Land Development Code. That concludes staff's presentation. Anyone have any questions? I have a question. So it, you, this assumes that you're catching them in the act or soon after they knock down trees? As soon as it's reported to us, okay. if, if they are still in the act, we would send code enforcement out there to stop work immediately. Usually we don't get, although we have been noticed when, uh, when they've been in the act before um, and we've been able to go out and stop them. In the case at Osprey Preserve, it was done and we didn't know until the day after, a couple of days afterwards. Is there any thought to if the trees have already been removed and taken off site, so you can't prove how many inches were taken off. Yeah, in the case um, of Osprey Preserve, they actually looked at some aerials, uh, satellite aerials, to uh, determine how many trees, how big they were. It's not an exact science. They ended up taking a, an average of a 10 inch DBH in order to get uh, the amount that they ended up with, so. Okay. Yeah. I have a dumb question, probably. No dumb question. But questions. this affects, like, how, does this affect, like, people who own their own homes land? Like, if I had a tree that was problemsome and I wanted to take it down, could I face a penalty? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And no. Campbell's my next-door neighbor now. <laughs> so our code... <laughs> yeah. No, right? No. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The answer is no. Okay. Madam Chair, are you ratting me out to... <laughs> oh, no, you, you can't have to take it down, no. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure that this this isn't like local homeowners that want to do, you know, changes to their landscaping. They're not going to, there wouldn't be a penalty assessed. To Actually, that. our code, and Kevin can expound on this, we have a one per one to one ratio replacement on residential. Okay. So if a tree gets taken down without a permit, it's a no fee permit, uh, neighbor reports them, we will ask for a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. And it doesn't have to be as big as the other tree, it just has to be a one-to-one -one replacement on residential. Okay, but it could be in a different location in the yard and all that kind of stuff. Okay, yes. all right. Can we make these penalties higher? Oh. Huh? That's pretty high. <laughs> I know, I was gonna say that's pretty high. Those are pretty high. <laughs> yeah. They're taking per tree. Per, that that adds other up. municipalities in, in Florida, Okay, are they? so yes, I looked at uh, Port St. Lucie. They have a th uh, three, times, uh, three times the mitigation ratio now. Um, it's not exact, they don't have amounts, but whatever their mitigation is required, they up it by three if there's penalty needed. Yeah, in addition to that, and, and Tom did a lot of research on this, but we also 
looked at the rate of inflation between 2001 and 2021, and these are very much over that. So okay. there is a penalty there. Um, I think the city, as a resource, is trying to defend as much as possible the existing trees in the in the city. Um, we're we're confident that these are very substantial uh, amounts. Um, we did a, and Tom did a bit of a calculation on what had happened before, and it's substantially. Um, I think yeah, it's how important. much? How much would Osprey have paid? Approximately, we ran those numbers. It would be two and a half million dollars. Yeah, that's a good yeah. number. Yeah. 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 yeah, I move approval. Yeah. Um, so, but there's no. So, would this be retroactive? So, like the the people that the example you used, because this wasn't there, they'll face no penalty, even though there was in 2001 was a there was. It was a settlement. Yeah. Okay. There was a settlement. It ended up uh, being about a half million dollars for the cost of the plants to. You can see in one of the slides that it, you can see a before and after. Oh yeah. This this is, I, this I, is the before and this is the after. I yeah. can promise you that if the commission would have pushed a 2.5 million dollar penalty against Osprey, they wouldn't have agreed to an estimated tree survey. Right. Okay. They would have gone to what Mr. Strom was saying. They would have made the city prove beyond a reasonable doubt because it's a criminal sanction. Um, what exactly was gone or not gone, and it would have been more complicated. I think it's more intended to be a deterrent and a tool that will lead people maybe in the future to avoid okay. it, and it will give the commission the ability to make it really uncomfortable. But realistically, it would be difficult to prove it afterwards because for over two million bucks, I could spend some money on people fighting it because mm -hmm. that's real money. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's something. Okay. All right, and did you formally make a motion? I move approval of staff's recommendation. Second. Tom, is there any idea of doing, having the developers do tree surveys, either full or partial? Yes, tree surveys, they, they do generally. Right. Um, it's required by code to do a tree right. survey, yes. So you actually, if there is a violation, you're going to have a pretty good idea. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So this over aerial... That was just Osprey because... Osprey, I don't know. That was a few years back when they originally were approved. Okay. I don't know how the actual tree survey... They actually used an aerial to do their tree survey, which was not generally what we accept. There is almost never a tree survey in an area where they're not going to remove any trees. In an Osprey... It was oh. intended the whole time to be a buffer, so there'd be no reason for a tree survey. It's the tree surveys are generally done right. where the site is going right. to have the development. So okay. is, is there a response to that? We we now ask for a full site tree survey. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fantastic. But good the, ordinance. Yeah, but an individual <laughs> lot owner, if they got some trees, they they come in and get a permit, right? Or that's not really. It's, free. To, permit, yeah, it's, free. it's, it's a, free. It's an individual lot owner can get a tree removal permit at no cost. Okay, but they still have to get the tree removal, permit. right? Okay, so they can remove it without a penalty of replacement, right? No, they said when one we, for one. Yeah, when we review a tree permit, a no fee tree permit, we look and make sure that it's, you know, not a quality oak or slash pine. Even, and, and they have to give us evidence that it's causing damage to the foundation of the home. We don't just let's say you can take it down because you don't like an oak tree necessarily, but if they insist on it and give us evidence of it causing damage, um, we give them the permit and you know we, we're reviewing it so we know what's happening. Okay, but I mean, if, if a homeowner's got something that's 30 feet, you know, 35 feet high, pretty big, it's could be a you know <laughs> potential damage to fall in the house. So I mean, yes, there's a host of reasons to remove a nice okay, good but tree. Yeah, there's also a state statute that says if you have an arborist that says the tree has to be removed because of health reasons and other stuff. There's, yeah. There's other exceptions. Okay. Because that there are a lot. To punish an individual homeowner, it's intended for somebody goes in and wipes out a buffer. 
Yeah, I, that, that's true. Because there's a lot of lots, old, old lots there in the city of Stewart that have some pretty good sized trees on them. Okay. <laughs> Board Member Strom. Yes. Board Member Mathers. Yes. Board Member Vitali. Yes. Board Member Rich. Yes. Chair Lorene. Yes. That was fast. All right, wonderful. <laughs> we have any comments online? Fantastic. Okay, meeting adjourned. <laughs>